So um, this actually, I'll just pause for a second and say this is Lao Zi, one of the, he was the teacher of Confucius in China, and a very wise, wise person. His writings are magnificent. Um, and John and I have been to visit the statue of Lao Zi uh, several times, and it, it's very fitting that the wisdom, uh, the deep, deep embedded wisdom of China is emerging to uh, deal with retinoblastoma in China. Um, John has no conflicts of interest. Uh, he's paid only to see patients. You'll see what an amazing job he's doing by himself, <laughs> sort of. Um, in China, there are more than a thousand new cases a year um, based on the calculations, not counted at this present time. They present as everywhere else in the world. In fact, retinoblastoma is exactly the same disease everywhere in the world. The hot spots that for once in a while are reported are not true when you actually look at the, infant, the birth rate. Um, and leukocoria is the strongest signal of retinoblastoma, the same as everywhere else. Um, this is just one child that the parents produced this lovely picture of their child uh, uh, six months later than the picture was taken when he was diagnosed with retinoblastoma and blowing up the picture of his eyes. You could see it was obvious in the picture, but no one had noticed admiring the scenery instead of looking at the child's eye in this picture. China is big. There's over 32 provinces. It's the third largest country by land mass after Canada and Russia. I didn't know that until I looked at John's slides. With a very scattered population, the dilemma for retinoblastoma treatment is that most centers for care all across the country lack any re re specific retinoblastoma expertise. And so they treat predominantly with enucleation, which is fine with, as far as I'm concerned, because you save lives that way. Few centers offer comprehensive treatment and survival Estimated in the big centers um, has been uh, is a, greater than 80 percent. In the collaborative centers measured recently is greater than 95 percent. So approaching the care in the world, but the small centers mortality would be still much higher. Um, these are the patients in 2006 to 2011 in the provinces and, and including Mongolia. Uh, the numbers are the numbers of patients distributed across the country. And you can see most of them are in the, uh, near the ocean, <laughs> uh, where the big cities are, Beijing and Shanghai, et cetera, and Guangzhou. So the barriers to optimal care are uh, late, no standard protocols in local hospitals, low follow-up rate due to the high cost of traveling for follow-up, and long transfer time from a tertiary center even once the diagnosis is made. And that leads to late stage diagnosis and low eye salvage rates. The cost to follow up in Beijing is um, large. The distances from the stars, the red stars, to travel to Beijing. And I'll go through. That was the first model. John did six months of a fellowship with us in Toronto and then had to go back quickly to China because they needed him to look after the retinoblastoma in Beijing at Tongren Hospital. And so what I'll show is the costs of treating patients in Beijing from all over China first. And you can see the distances and where they travel and the amount of money is significant just for the travel compared to very, very low salaries. The financial cost to the patient, um, half of it is the medical bill, but a very large proportion of it is the travel cost and accommodation. And the cost of time to, for going to, from home to Beijing would take five to seven days. At that time, to do an examination under anesthetic, they had to be admitted to the hospital. They had to have clinical testing. When I first went visited them and followed John through a series of EUAs, they also all had a chest x-ray every time they came for their EUA. So we, that has been abolished. Nobody has a chest x-ray anymore. And then to fly home. So this is a big burden on families. So it's often better for the whole family to take out the eye. Um, and this is just a case example, a child born in June diagnosed with retinoblastoma in November, bilateral retinoblastoma groups A and E, the left eye removed immediately, 
and the, le the right eye, uh, left eye removed, and the right eye, error in the slide, treated with cryotherapy for a, a small tumor. But the last follow-up was uh, uh, April 2010, and everything was stable with a scar. And then in uh, a year later, the right eye was enlarged and the child died of a recurrence or a new tumor because no one was watching. The purpose of multicenter collaboration, which is John's solution to this burden of care, is to establish a standard across China and improve follow-up salvage rate, eye salvage rate and survival rate and reduce financial burden to healthcare and the family. The collaborating centers emerging, John went back in 2006 from Toronto, and in 2013, you'll see there were more than 20 centers uh, all working together, and he would travel to every center every month or every two months and train a team in each place, but supervise it and see all the patients. And as of 2018, uh, there are 29 centers that he now travels between. And they're mapped out here with their Chinese names all over the country, and they approximate the population density. So the standard of care across the collaborating centers, they all use the same Murphy International Retinostoma Classification, um, published by Lynn Murphy in 2005, which had been worked on by all of us, many of us, over many years before that, and Lynn finally pulled all those ideas together and produced the classific International Retinostoma Classification. The, uh, just as a little side, uh, that has been very much confused by another classification which changed critical features and it meant that the D and E eyes kind of merged and you couldn't tell which are the dangerous eyes anymore by the classification. So now we've gone to what I introduced in my talk of the uh, TNM, the 8th edition 2017 TNM, which is based on all this prior knowledge, actually evidence based also on a world survey, which many of you contributed details of your patients to that survey, and that went into how the, the collaborative group in the TNM, led by Ashwin Malapatna from India, but now in Australia. Um, and that's a, a much better system to replace all the previous systems. So we'll keep calling them ABC in China for the moment. The same treatment protocol is uh, now in all 29 centers, with group A, B, and C getting chemotherapy or just focal therapy as appropriate. Um, group D um, for unilateral enucleation, unless in vision is excellent and optic nerve seen, and then you can attempt to save in China a unilateral eye. And um, Bilateral patients get chemo first and then other things, and now, of course, they also get intraarterial chemotherapy. But again, the criteria for who's eligible for intraarterial chemotherapy is, is a problem we, I won't talk about more. And group E, by Murphy classification, group E still gets a nucleation, but that creeps because the other classifications save lots of EIs, so what should you do? And all the patients have the same follow-up schedule, et cetera. So it makes an incredibly powerful group. Um, it, by traveling, that's John um, teaching somebody uh, and teaching in the OR. I've watched him in the OR, and he teaches as he goes, but he sees every retina in total and depresses every retina and makes, misses nothing at all. And he doesn't look with the indirect ophthalmoscope unless there's a specific reason. He does it all with the RETCAM. And then he carries the RETCAM images are in his computer and he has them from all the children. So in patients we're studying, I say, what did it look like at diagnosis or at the time you did whatever procedure? And he can pull up the pictures from his computer. And then he, he didn't put this in stock, but I'll add it. Then he uh, has a room about as big as this stage with two or two beds, two anesthetists, recovery beds over here, and one door over there, which is the only entrance door into the room. Then magically, he finishes this child, and he goes to the door and opens the door, and the parents of that child are standing at the door. But outside the door is a room as big as this whole auditorium, with full of parents and grandparents and everyone else. But the ones that John's meant to talk to are at the door. I don't know how this happens. But the whole team in every single center is about 20 people making this day work, and it's, it's absolutely incredible to watch. 
And if he needs to laser, he'll stop and ask for a laser. The laser gets put on his head, and he does whatever he needs to do. He can do laser and cryo as he's going. If it needs an enucleation or needs something else or needs to go to intraarterial chemo, that gets done a after. But he talks to the parents in great detail every, between every patient and gives them the pictures. They hold the medical record in China, not the institution. Um, so the other thing is motivating the families to get together, and they now have, um, um, if a patient, to, to be seen, the patient goes to WeChat, and they all get enrolled in different groups on WeChat. They schedule their visits. Uh, he publishes which sitter he'll be in, in which, on WeChat, so the parents can know and follow. They should go to that one for their attention. The local hospitals put the on WeChat, the contact person for the families to call to get their name on the list, and the patients make the appointment, and John goes to the local hospital to, on the published day. Um, parents um, apply dilating drops before they get in. This is for the follow-ups, not for the active treatment eyes, but for the ongoing follow-ups to reduce the burden of, of EUAs. And um, the parents will put in the drops. They will hold the child while John examines with the ret cam. They're watching the pictures as he's there. He can be telling them what he's seeing. There's the flat scar. He doesn't depress, so any child that needs full examination still goes to anesthetic. And that produces, by moving to more topical anesthetics for follow-up, that reduces a whole lot of things like the time in the city of the center of excellence, the duration of the procedure, the um, cost, et cetera. But you'll see that for an EUA, the duration is says at least 15 minutes. It isn't quite true, but maybe it is sometimes. I've seen it much less than that. In fact, I've watched and sat behind John watching him see 50 patients in a day. And I would write down the time the baby was on the table till the time the next baby was on the table. And it was averaged at eight minutes. And he didn't miss anything. I said all this, I think. This has allowed um, much less cost, larger patient population, and um, um, solved part of the problem of the few specialists by traveling and an optimized approach to examination. Here's just the provincial we track groups and the group members, and you can they, they all can watch each other with the posting as I described. Um, the statistics of numbers of patients from 2012 to 2017. Um, these are EUAs that John has done more than two. 2,000 every year, and new cases. You can see the numbers in the second row and the numbers of enucleations and his numbers of visits to uh, individual centers. Last year, um, John and his retinoblastoma team across China, with me helping them, um, produced a paper in submitted to ophthalmology, but they were frightened of this paper. They were very, very frightened that to talk about lumpectomy for retinoblastoma was heresy, and we would kill all the children. So um, we ended up being demoted from a research paper in ophthalmology to a report, and the paper got better because it was shorter, and all the redundancies of the full paper disappeared, and it's really easy to read this paper, and I insisted they keep our two major figures and all our figures as supplementary. So you can see the whole thing, and it's better as a report. Um, so what we show there is, um, in red, the data from 2013. And in the, in the paper, it was only the first half of 2013. Because John points out that all other cancers talk about the five-year survival rate. So we better wait till we know what the five-year survival rate is. So we are now working on the paper for the 2013 whole group. And that has a survival rate, a, a, a follow-up of, of close to um, five years. And that red numbers of loss to follow-up is 3% over that whole of the year of 2013. And the cause of death, six, uh, the deaths were 6%. The death from the eye that had the PPV was 3%. Um, but some of those are because the parents refused enucleation. 
and then other causes where different things uh, associated with uh, the other eye was what killed the child or something like that. So that's the new paper that uh, we should have worked on all day yesterday when John was not here. <laughs> we'll do that Saturday afternoon on the phone. <laughs> These are his flights um, from 2011 till now. Um, more than 660 flights, 29 times around the world in kilometers, um, 79 hours in airplanes, and a half, but half of the trips he goes to see patients are now on the high-speed trains in China, which are spectacular, and he would much prefer that over flying. It's much, much more efficient and much more fun. So this is a map of his flights, um, international in, on the left, and his flights within China on the right. And he can produce this because the, 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 the airline data gives you this. It doesn't have the trains on here because there's no system for collecting your train mileage. So thank you very much. I, I, I'm very happy to be able to communicate on behalf of John Chow, the amazing work he is doing in a very large country with very large numbers of widely distributed patients. Thank you. <laughs>